and I think I stopped around verse number um, all the way down to verse 16. Be of the same mind. We talk, talked a little bit about that, being of the same mind. And that, again, it's not, a, it's not a matter that everybody has to agree on everything. But the same purpose, the same desires that we should have as a church. And um, so we might, we might have a, 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 our way of going about it uh, to witness to somebody. It might be totally different from somebody else's way. But the truth needs to be the same. It's, it's about Jesus Christ. So the same mind is saying, uh, I know that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. And we're going to look at that again in, in the morning service. But um, having that heart and that attitude, and maybe uh, I might do it differently than other people. It's not, a, it's not that big a deal, but the truth needs to be told. So being of one mind is uh, that we have the same uh, main purpose. Well, he goes on in that verse, in verse 16, and he says this, mind not high things. <laughs> that doesn't mean you can't pay attention to mountains, okay? What does that, anybody have an idea what it means, mind not high things? Kind of a, a it's an old way of putting it, but anybody have an idea? Not to Find the things of man and what they create. Right. What what man? What uh, the important things that are that the world thinks are important. Uh, high things meaning. Um, it, and it's not a it's not a bad thing to to respect somebody who is important, but uh, to dwell on it and consider it more important or that person more important than uh, other people. Mind not high things is, is spending your time thinking about it, to mind it. Um, and then and you can you can see kind of what he's what he's talking about when you when you look at the next sentence, condescend to men of low estate. Mm -hmm. So we should have we should consider like God does every person as important as, as every other person. <coughs> God does not, uh, how, does, how does the Bible say it, um, is not a respecter of persons. So that's the way we should be. And uh, not, not, not considering somebody who, is, who the world thinks is important as looking up. Can you imagine, I, I don't get it. That, and I know other people say the same thing. Who are these Hollywood people anyway? They are, they are the, the, they're actors, right? And actresses, singers. Um, what do they know about the world? Well, they might know a lot about the world, but they got the wrong attitude, the wrong thoughts about it. And people are looking up to them as, oh, they are somebody special. Or, no offense, uh, Tim, but baseball players, he doesn't think, he doesn't do that. He likes baseball. He likes baseball. But uh, the world looks up to these millionaires and think, oh, look at, he's so great, or this and that. And, well, we're supposed to consider the lower people as important as the other, uh, other people. Uh, go, go over to Romans, go back to Romans uh, 11. And look at verse number 19. Thou wilt say then, and now, now let, me, let me just point out what he's talking about. He's talking about uh, the Jewish people have, in a, in a sense, uh, the Jewish nation is no longer, uh, as, <laughs> how do I put it, uh, they are not saved, okay? And the only way of salvation is through Jesus Christ and understanding what God has done through Jesus Christ. So the Jewish people have, have stepped back and said, you know, we're, Jesus is not the Messiah. And so they don't have the salvation that God has, has given. In the Old Testament, when people had their faith in God, and, and truly their faith in God, 
uh, trusting him, then Jesus' blood covers them and takes care of them. Uh, but the people who reject God and don't have the faith in God and today will not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are outside of God's family. And so God, Paul is talking about the Gentiles being grafted in. And he's using the picture of an of a, um, olive tree. And you can have an olive tree in your yard that somebody has taken care of, and it's, we would call it domesticated. But then there are some, well, I think they call them feral uh, olive trees out growing up. And you can take a branch from an uh, olive tree out in the wild and bring it in and graft it to a good olive tree, and you can have two different kinds of olives on your olive tree. So this is what he's saying that God has done with the Gentiles to graft them into his new family. Okay, uh, the family of, of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, so he says to the Gentiles, he's talking to the Romans, and he says, Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Okay, now what's, what's he pointing out? He's saying, you're, you're looking to yourself more highly than you should think. Hey, God grafted me in. And, uh, okay, that's good. But he goes on to say, well, that's good. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. Okay? And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded. Now, that word there, high-minded, is the same uh, word. It, it's not the same word, but it's a, it's a compound word that means the same thing as he says, mind not high things. Uses the mind and high are the same words back in Romans 12 as what are being put together here in high minded. It's I'm somebody. And so he says, don't be high minded. Why? He says, but fear. For Verse number 21, for if God spared not the natural branches, what do you think he can do? Take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Now, he's not talking about you're, uh, you're going to lose your salvation. If he has already grafted you in, you're not going to be lost. But you can be separated from him if you live with this high mind in this, in this uh, proud way. Look over at Romans chapter 12, and verse number 3. Yeah, it's interesting that, that Paul is... Yeah, when we read these, these chapters, it's like we see... We might not see it, but there's these bits and pieces. And it's like he's got this, this thought, making sure that the Romans and us understand that God hates pride. Okay? Look at verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Now, soberly, remember, is, doesn't always mean uh, without uh, not being under the influence of alcohol. It means that you're thinking squarely. You've got the right way of thinking. Don't be thinking that you're better than somebody, and at the same time, don't think you're worse than people. There are people who, who are so focused on themselves. No, I'm nobody. Oh, nobody likes me. No. Stop it. Okay? God loves you, and uh, we've got to keep that in our, our minds. And that, that's, a, that's a form of pride, okay? Thinking too low of yourself. Um, but condes condescend what he says in Romans 12. But look at what he says. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. I trust God. I believe God gave Jesus Christ. And God. And I, I understand that God cares about me and God loves me. And I don't have to be, don't think that I'm worse than anybody else. But I don't think highly. We are not to think more highly of ourselves. Now, verse number three there, remember what verses one and two say? That's the ones we always memorize, right? And it's talking about renewing our minds. Don't be conformed to the world. The world wants to be proud. The world wants to think that humans are the, are, uh, uh, the highest form of animal. And uh, 
God says, renew your mind. Don't think like the world. Don't act like the world. Change your way. Be transformed. So uh, whatever way we're thinking, if, if we're thinking like the world, then let's say a group like this. We have four people thinking like the world and 20 people who are thinking like Christ wants them to think. Can you have one mind in the church? Well, if those four just continue thinking like the world, they're not going to be conformed to what Christ wants because they're focused on other things. And so God says, set those things aside. God has a purpose for us, and uh, he wants us to live in a way that is pleasing to him by um, not focusing on me. And when I say me, I'm, that's what I'm talking about, all of us, okay? Not you focus on me. Because I, I want you to focus on me, okay? Right now, especially when I'm... <laughs> but we all should be focusing on other people. Uh, look, at, look at what Jesus said, how Jesus says it in Mark chapter 8. You remember the, the, the account where... Um, Different people came up to Jesus and said, uh, I, I want to follow you, but I want to do this. I need to do this first. I want to follow you, but uh, my dad, I need to go bury my father. Uh, I need to. I just took a wife, and I need to go cheer her up. And, and what Jesus says is, you can't have a double mind. If you want to follow me, follow me. And, um, and, and he doesn't mean to get rid of all of these things. And it don't, doesn't mean for a husband to leave his wife. He doesn't want that. But she, understand, she needs to be second. Second place. Not, not first place. Okay? With everybody else in the whole world, she's first place. But when you compare that with your relationship with God, God is first. And when, you work, when God is first, our relationships with others will be perfect. Okay? Now they'll come into place. Uh, Roman, uh, Mark chapter 8, look what he says in verse number 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What does it mean to take up a cross? There's going to be burdens. There's going to be you're going to you're going to have difficulty sometimes. You have a burden to bear. Remember the picture I see here is what uh, probably what they did with all the most of the uh, criminals and people that they crucified made them carry their own cross up to the burial ground, and we know that they made Jesus do that. And apparently he must have been so weak that they got somebody else to carry his cross. But we are to carry our own cross. We will have burdens and we have responsibilities in this world. And he says, if you're going to follow me, just remember that you're supposed to deny yourself, okay? Just saying, you are not important right now. Yeah, yeah, take care of your things yourself and take care of your people around you. But don't set them above me. You have a burden. You have responsibilities. Take care of those. But... Um, Follow me. So Paul says, condescend to men of low estate, back in Romans 12. And uh, it, remember that when God tells us how to live, he tells us uh, how we are to be towards others. So if, if God, and I, I think I just recently said this, and I, it's just sometimes it gets so strong, we, we need to remember, strong in my mind, um, we need to remember that God never tells me to tell you how to treat me. Okay? Uh, God tells me how to treat you. God tells you how to treat others. God tells you how to treat me. I am, to con I am to be concerned about how I am in relationship with others before God. Am I doing it right? If they're doing it wrong, what, I, what am I supposed to do about you treating somebody wrong or you treating me wrong? What am I supposed to do about it? 
I don't, okay, there are two things but uh, that, he, that they mentioned, and there's a, th a third thing that I was going to say. He said nothing, and I understand that. But I think nothing goes along with what Tim said, love. And it also goes along with what I was, I was thinking, uh, pray for him. You know, there's, 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 it's not my responsibility. It's not my business to tell you how to treat me. I might say how you should treat somebody else because I under I know that. But if somebody's mistreating me, I don't. I have no responsibility, no command from God to say, make sure they treat you well. Okay. Um, go to Deuteronomy. Um, let's go. Let's go to Exodus thirty first. Ex thirty first. Exodus thirty. And verse number 13. And you, you might look at this and say, well, what, is, what does that have to do with anything? Um, with what we're talking about. Exodus chapter 30, look at verse number 13. Now God gives the, the Jewish people, the Israelites, uh, instructions on what kind of offerings to give and things like that. Okay, And this is one of those. And I, but I'll, I'm just not going to focus on the offering or anything. I want to focus on what he says here. This they shall give, every one that passeth. Now, he's saying this is what they're going to give. He hasn't told them yet. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered, half a shekel. Okay, this is what they're supposed to give, half a shekel. After the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 giras, and half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Okay. <laughs> what is a shekel of the sanctuary? Anybody know? Okay, money you give to the church, it can be, but there's it's it's a little more detailed than that. If I were to tell you I want something that is exactly 12 inches long, how do you know if it's exactly 12 inches long? Okay, use a ruler, measure it. With what? A ruler. a ruler. Okay. How do you know that that ruler is 12 inches long? I'm, I'm, I'm making you think, okay? <laughs> Come on. How do you know that that ruler is 12 inches long? Somebody told you. Okay, somebody told you? Trust it. Trust it? Compare it with another one? Oh, so they're, so they're both 12, 12 inches, 12 and a half inches. And they, they, but they compare to each other. That, that won't prove that it's 12 inches. What did you say? I say compare it with another ruler. Compare it with, there's a standard. There's an exact standard, 12 inches. I don't know where that is. It's probably at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Colorado. Okay. But there is a standard that everything is measured to. So what we're seeing here is the standard, the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel was a weight... How did anybody know how much a shekel was? Well, they take their little shekel, and they take it to the sanctuary where the standard was kept. And so the sanctuary, and this is God's sanctuary. It's a, what's a sanctuary? It's a holy place. So you're going to trust that standard. Okay, I wanted to get that because I'm going to, to someplace else. And it has to do with, with our relationships. Okay, let's go over to Deuteronomy now. And see several places, three three different passages we're going to see. Uh, one in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy twenty five. Deuteronomy twenty five, and look at verse number fifteen. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight. That doesn't mean I weight exactly the right weight. It's talking about the how I'm how we how they bought things. You you, you buy th bought things with a certain weight of silver or a certain weight of gold, and so he's saying you'll have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure. They didn't use twelve inches, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the measure they, they used a cubit or something. Uh, a just measure shalt thou have that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. What's he saying? He's saying, be honest. Don't, don't grab your shekel and make it a little bit less. 
or more, depending on what's going to uh, benefit you. When you weigh your standard in the scales, your standard is to be exactly like the standard of God, of weight. Okay, that shekel in the sanctuary, if you put two shekels over here and you put one shekel over here, it's going to be like this. You put a shekel and a quarter over here, it's going to be like this. But when is it going to be exactly two shekels? When you get exactly two shekels over here. Okay, so he's saying you be honest in your dealings with other people. You be just. Just, what, what does just mean? Righteous. Righteous. Okay, he said, well, what do you mean? Uh, thou shalt have, uh, he says, thou shalt have a perfect and righteous weight. How, did you know you can you have a you, you can pull out a quarter out of your pocket and that is a righteous quarter because it's it's worth not it's worth twenty five cents like it used to be but uh, it's still it's still a quarter it's still valued at one quarter of a dollar so he's saying righteous and wait be that way that's the way we should be go over to Proverbs chapter eleven. Proverbs 11 and verse number 1. A false balance. There's that, that balance, that uh, scale that we're talking about. A false balance is, whoa, what's that word? Abomination to the Lord. What's abomination mean? It's what? Something wrong. It's it's. It's, hate, it's hated by God. It's an abomination. Sin is an abomination to God. And so if we are, if we are balancing something that is wrong or we're treating people um, in the context that we're talking about how we treat one another, if I treat this person well and I treat this person evil just because I choose to, that's an abomination to God. We are to treat one another, just like God treats us equal. You know, you might look at, well, Abraham was rich, and I'm not rich. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we are. We are rich in, in uh, God's spiritual riches. And uh, uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the value of a person. God values you equal to Abraham. God values you equal to Bob Hudson. Pick a name. You are just as important as everybody else to God. That's the way we are to be to one another. Are you more important to me than uh, the people over by the police station? You shouldn't be. I'm the only one who can answer that. And then you're the only one who can answer it, having to do with yourself. But God wants us to be um, just in our, our uh, treating other people. And he says, but a just weight, a righteous weight, is his delight. Okay? When we are treat one another properly, he is pleased. Go over to Proverbs 16 and look at verse number 11. Now we're talking about God here. He says, a just weight, that's that righteous weight, and balance are the Lord's. Even the balance things are perfect. Um, just when they're empty, it's a perfect balance with God. A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are His work. What does it mean, all the weights of His... All the weights of the bag... That's how they carried him, the weights in a bag. And so the, the merchant man who was weighing out the chicken, and he says, okay, it's uh, $4 a pound. <laughs> Might be four shekels a pound. So he weighed the, the chicken, and he puts down the shekels and sees, okay, how much does this weigh? And he gets four and a half shekels, and uh, you have to pay him four and a half shekels of, of silver or something. 
so you get that chicken. And it's and but he's honest and he puts the weights in a bag and keeps them there until he needs them again. So all the weights in God's bag are perfect. And he is righteous in all that he does. So we are to be uh, righteous in that way. And what what <laughs> rule do you think? Can you picture in your mind? Anybody thought of it already? It's a, a special rule that we have. Even the world recognizes it. What is it called? The golden rule. And and it's biblic it's based on what Jesus said. He didn't say it just like this. And I'm not going to take you to the to, actually let's let's do it. I have the the reference down. Go to Luke chapter six. We have uh today you might you might say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And people play with that and say other things about it, but it's it's wrong. It's do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And what does that mean? You treat them like you want to be treated. Verse number, chapter 6, verse number 31. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. I want, I want to be treated with respect. I think everybody does. So how should we treat other people with respect? Respectful. And uh, treating them with, with love because we want to be treated with love. So he says, do to them, and we'll, we'll see it. Well, you see it right at the end of chapter of verse number, chapter 12. Look at Romans chapter 12, and look at the very end. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So Jesus says, if you want to be treated this way, treat them the way you want to be treated. But what if they treat me badly? What if they're mean to me? I should fight back. Overcome evil with good. And, and that's a, a hard thing to do. We are to treat them as well as we want to be treated. <gasps> that guy... That guy is so mean. He's mean to me. He's mean to them, and he treats them badly. And I'm supposed to be good to that person? Exactly. Why? Because that's what God wants. When are we supposed to be evil towards somebody? Never. Never. Can you defend yourself and and in a in a, a extreme case? Can you defend yourself and your property by killing somebody? Okay. Did you treat them evil? No. Because it's it's defense. Okay. And I don't want to deal with all that, but that's that's uh, God had people defend themselves. He had people kill people. And and it, it wasn't because they were being evil. They were doing God's will. So, but if somebody treats me badly and looks at me cross-eyed, I should not go, I should treat them good. Not Treat them equal. Treat, look at them cross-eyed. Not even equal. Treat them better than they treat us. That's a, that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, we should be toward other people the way we want to be treated. Well, let's go back to Romans 12 and look at verse uh, 15. And, and this really, it, it, it helps us understand, even if in the church there are some people who are, who are more difficult to be around but he says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. He tells us in 1 Corinthians, when one member suffers, then what should happen? All of the members should suffer with it. Not, the, not in the same way, but they should, we should feel. Put ourselves in their place and, and consider if that thing happened to me, how would I feel? And if I feel bad then I should feel bad for that person. I should love that person and uh, weep with them. Now, if he says that, if he says rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep, if I'm focused on me, how am I going to do that? I, I don't even know they're weeping. I don't even know the trouble that they're going through. So I couldn't suffer with them and I couldn't weep with them because I'm more weeping about me 
No, God wants us to be watching out for other people, keeping our focus on them. Go over to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and look at verse number 14. These all, now he, he mentioned the names of the, of the uh, 11 apostles who were in this upper room. Uh, and really there was more, more than, than the 11 that were there. And later it, it comes out, well, in verse number 15, it tells us there are about 120 people. Uh, verse number 14 says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So one accord. They had one purpose. And they were all there. What was their purpose? Anybody remember what their purpose was here? One accord. I said remember, but you're looking it up. <laughs> That's okay. Who can tell me? What, what were they in one accord about? They waited for waiting for the power from heaven waiting for the Holy Spirit to come down yeah they had that one purpose and how long did they do it hmm? it was the 40th day it was 40 days had passed but it was 10 days because it was the day of Pentecost 50 days later so it's 10 days they they prayed and they met together waiting because Jesus had gone to heaven and he said wait here and for the power and so they waited and it was another another 10 days that's why we call it the day of Pentecost 50 days after uh, the resurrection or the Passover so uh, one mind go over to Acts chapter 12 we're looking at examples of the early church having one mind one purpose Acts chapter 12, and verse number 5, it says here, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So prayer was made without ceasing. That means they were praying for Peter while he was in prison. And if you know the story, uh, God sent an angel, and the angel told, uh, kicked him on the side and said, Peter, get up, put your, put your sandals on, and, and come with me. And they walked out of the prison. The gate opened, and, and they walked out of the prison. And uh, then, then Peter was left alone. He went to a house. Anybody remember whose house he went to? Hmm? Not, well, um, Rhoda was there, but uh, it might not have been. It wasn't her house. It was Mark's mother, I believe. Verse number uh, 12. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together. What? Praying. Praying, Praying for what? Verse 5. Peter. And, 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 and we, we want, <laughs> where's the faith? They're praying for Peter, right? I, we don't know what they were praying. Uh, what, was it praying just that they wouldn't, Herod wouldn't kill him? Uh, praying that he would be released? Or praying that he could uh, handle the suffering? We don't know. But if they were praying that he would be released, then somebody didn't have faith because when Rhoda went to the door and heard Peter's voice, she went back and told them. Uh, Peter's at the door. And they said, you're crazy. It says, there, it says they, said, they said, you're mad. And that's what it means. You're crazy. Uh, but, but that's what it was. But they were there praying of one accord. And verse number five tells us um, they were praying to God for him, for Peter. And uh, so again, we need to have, uh, we need to be like-minded, have the same purpose, the same desire. 
So if we ask ourselves, what, where is my thinking? Am I thinking more of me and what's going on in my life than I am about uh, God's work, and what God wants for me and how I'm to treat other people? Do I think more of me and I can't, I can't see the problems in somebody else's life and I, I don't suffer with them? I don't pray for them like I should? God wants us to have the desires of our heart. He says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. But what's what's that first part? Delight thyself in the Lord. And the more we think about and live for the Lord and, and seek his guidance and his help, the more we're going to be delighted in life. And we'll be able to suffer. I'm not saying suffer with delight for the other people who are suffering, but we'll know how to deal with it. God will give us the grace to go through other people's difficult times because we are walking with Him and delighting in Him. Jesus tells us to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek God's righteousness. We don't have to dwell on our things and our needs because if I seek God's righteousness... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then what does Jesus say? All these things, these other things that we might be considering, other things we might be worrying about or focused on. He says, you seek me and my righteousness. Everything else is going to take care of itself. Or I'll take care of it. Okay, It doesn't take care of itself because God's the one who does it. And so we've got to keep our focus on in that way. Um, so what do we think about? What, what do we dwell on? Is, are we dwelling on uh, the things that Christ wants us to dwell on? Or do we dwell on us? You know, the early church, we talked about the, uh, uh, them praying, being of one accord. They prayed before the Holy Spirit came. Here they prayed that, uh, uh, for Peter. They all had the same purpose, the same desire. What does the Bible say? that the people who are not Christians, people who are not part of the church, what do they say about the church or the people? Remember what they said? These that have done what? Wreak havoc. Wreak havoc, sort of. Where they've turned the world what? Upside down. upside down. Have you ever seen the world upside down? <laughs> yeah, what is it? <laughs> Just... Well, and there are people who say, tell, tell us that evil things are good and good things are evil. And so that's upside down. But these people, they said, these people have changed the way we're all thinking. They're trying to, to change the world. And they did a good job. How did they do a good job? They were with one accord. Had the same heart, the same mind. They worked for the same goal. The same goal was to reach people with Jesus for Jesus Christ. And so that should be our main goal, to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the more people who come to know Christ, the more the world will be turned back around on its head or on its feet, the way it should be. And that's our job. The Bible tells us to live peaceably with all men. But he says, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. If they will allow you to live peaceably with them, never does it does the Bible ever tell us to fight back, to get angry, uh, treat people improperly. It says our actions should be good actions. So if I'm able to live peaceably with these people who disagree with me, if they will allow me to have my own thoughts and my own beliefs. But it's too many times people want to change what you and I believe. And we have a right, everyone has a right, Amen. to believe their own way. Amen. And yes, we give truth, but you don't beat people over the head saying, you know, you've got to believe this way. Either believe this way or, I'll, or you'll die. That's the way some religions are. If you don't believe their way, uh, you, you don't have any right to live. don't have any right to think your way. But we need to think God's way. Be 
of one mind, of one heart. Uh, we are not to be the cause of disharmony because of our evil actions. We might be the cause of disharmony because of what we believe. But as long as we're believing what God says and walking with Him, the disharmony is not our fault. Okay? But we need to believe. Do good, as Paul said, render to no man evil for evil. Overcome evil by doing good. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your instructions. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn to, uh, I'll say, be good. Uh, Lord, I know that many times we have the wrong uh, attitude, the wrong heart. Uh, and because of that, we might say things that are improper or say things that are hurtful. But Lord, I pray that you would help us, not just to one another, but to the world. Help us to do good and not evil. Guide us now as we go into our worship service. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.